All right, good afternoon, everyone. Got a, quite a few bills on the calendar this afternoon, and um, we're going to start with uh, Representative Jurgison, House Bill 378, which is a change from the original plan. House Bill 378 with Repre Representative Jurgison, and if uh, Representative, if you'll present from the podium, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon to everybody in the committee. Um, uh, Representative, if you would, because I know there was a, a recent substitute handed out, yep. if you'd be kind enough to let us know the LC number that you're working off of, please. Absolutely. It's LC 37-1194-S. 1194-S. And let me tell you the reason for the substitute. It is the same bill other than there's a Part 2 and the bill was redrafted should Chairman Chanel's bill that we passed last week for public health commissioner be signed into law by the governor, then it gives an effective date for this bill so that it falls under the public, commission, public health commissioner as opposed to the public health director. It's the same bill, but we had to, we thought it prudent to do that instead of leaving it up to code revision. So uh, that's the reason that we're working off the substitute. But I appreciate you allowing me to, to bring this bill before you today. This bill deals with uh, hemophilia and the uh, hemophilia uh, community in Georgia. And for those of you that aren't aware, hemophilia is a lifelong bleeding disorder that results from a genetic deficiency of a blood clotting protein. And it can lead to spontaneous internal bleeding and prolonged bleeding following injuries after surgery. Or, or injuries themselves. Uh, when a person with hemophilia is injured, they don't necessarily bleed long, harder or faster than a person without hemophilia. Basically, they bleed longer because of a clotting disorder. What, what this bill does is it creates a board under the uh, Department of Public Health and the Commissioner of Public Health and they will be charged with four, doing four things. Uh, lines are in the first part of the bill, so under 31.112 gives the um, membership of the board. And then on the next section of the bill, it gives the four main responsibilities of the board. But I want to point out one very important thing to some of my, my good friends that I know that we're all concerned about this, and, and that's... Uh, that is uh, item number item number four under thirty one one twelve, and I'll give you the exact line number because I'm working off of two different these two different versions here. Line number Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Line 65, you knew exactly what I was looking for. Line 65, members of the Hemophilia Advisory Board shall receive no compensation for services uh, for their service on the board. This is truly a volunteer board, and it's supported by those in the community. Uh, the four main uh, tasks of the board is to ha uh, pro make any recommendations or proposed legislative or administrative changes to policy or programs that are integral to the health and wellness of individuals with hemophilia or other bleeding disorders. The second thing that the board will do is um, look at standards of care and treatment for persons living with hemophilia. The third is uh, be involved and help with the development of community-based initiatives to increase awareness of care and treatment for persons living with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders, and finally help with coordination of public and private, private support networks uh, in the state of Georgia. So those are the four main things that they're tasked with. And then finally, a um, uh, representative asked me a few minutes ago, what then? What happens after that? Well, that's the last part, Section G, and they will uh, file an annual um, 
report to the governor and the general assembly on the status of any recommendations as a pro as a um, proposed by the board and so uh, this body this committee uh, will be privy to those reports and uh, should there be any recommended changes they will not be automatically implemented but simply um, passed on for our recommendation as a recommendation for us to purview uh, with that mr. chair madam chair I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions Who's number 28, please? Representative Byrd. Thank you, Representative Jurgensen. Um, per our conversation earlier about a sunset, would you be willing to entertain a sunset for this advisory board? Should the, should the committee want, wish to implement that, I would certainly entertain it. Very good. Thank you. At the proper time. Representative Byrd, any other questions for members, member of the, the author of the bill? I, I would just like to say that we see these from time to time, um, and I just want to applaud you and point out to the members of the committee, specifically line 50 and line 121, which uh, has a, a member that has hemophilia on the, the council. And a lot of times that's not included, so that's a, a good thought on your part. Uh, the chair at this time will entertain a motion. A motion move in a second. Any discussion? Representative Byrd? Yes, thank you. I would like to ask for a an ending date. I don't know, two years from now, from the date that it begins is I'm at the will of the committee. I would like to offer then from the date that it starts. Do you have a specific um, wording, line, and proper amendment form? I do not. The, the chair is the sensitive, and I, I'll give you a minute or two if you need to find a place to put it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know there yes. was somebody that wished to, to address the committee briefly. Okay, um, we'll, we'll do that while Representative Byrd is working on uh, Representative C Chairwoman Cooper. Um, well, that's really confusing. <laughs> that's fine. I... If the committee uh, is, n if the board is not going to re re get any compensation, I, I don't understand why there would be a need, or could you explain to me a need for a sunset provision? Since hemophilia seems to be continuing to go on and all. Representative Byrd. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, certainly, uh, as government grows around here, oftentimes there are agencies, departments, other entities that go on indefinitely. So that's why I would like to see a sunset, whether it's volunteer or not. And on many cases, then all of a sudden that volunteer becomes paid. Thank you. Representative Maddox. Could I say that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with maybe some con uh, sunsets, but, you know, it takes a while to get these appointments established, and since there's no compensation, uh, would you consider making that five years? I agree. <laughs> Representative. Let's, let's, let's just do it long enough rather than, than just to make it, and then by the time you get it made, it's over with. Representative Pack. Representative Jurgensen, um, I'm sorry, I missed out a turn. I noticed that there is a requirement here uh, that the board meet at least quarterly. Is that a request by um, the person? Because I realize a lot of times the volunteers have a hard time meeting again together. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, at least twice a year or something lower than that, with the option of meeting more often if they want. I'm just the, wondering the, whether it was quarterly. I, I appreciate that question, and, and you know, I am – uh, the specifics of that, I think we, we can certainly leave up to the board. It's typically, though, my experience with boards of this nature, um, and, and somebody else might want to address that, but that's typically the case uh, with issues like this, that quarterly is, is the usual uh, time frame. Um, but again, I, I am certainly uh, amenable if, if, if you wanted to have language that said it, uh, 
at least twice a year and let the board make that determination, I, I have no problem with that. Thank you, Representative Pack. And we have a, someone who'd like to speak on the bill. Please tell us who you are. And yes, proceed. thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Cornett. I've been a nurse for over 20 years with Hemophilia of Georgia, which is the nonprofit agency that serves people with bleeding disorders throughout our state. And um, I hope the bill looks familiar because two years ago uh, we had the same language uh, come before you. Uh, hemophilia is a rare disorder, but it's very, very expensive. Uh, it costs our health care system a lot of money. Uh, it's anywhere from 30000 to over $500,000 a year per patient just for medicine. And there are a lot of opportunities right now now, uh, for instance, the federal pre-existing condition insurance plans that we've enrolled a lot of people in. And this uh, bill sets up at no cost to the state a structure so that doctors, nurses, social workers, and patients can come together with public health to take advantage of a lot of these new opportunities. And uh, we're very excited about it and want to give our, our strong support. The other part of the bill where it talks about some of the uh, education campaigns, uh, the Centers for Disease Control has uh, done a, a research study in the state of Georgia that found that we have a lot of women with bleeding disorders, uh, specifically von Willebrand disease, which is also covered under this bill, uh, that are not diagnosed. And the tragedy of that is that these women go for years with very heavy, prolonged menstrual bleeding, and many of them wind up having unnecessary surgeries like hysterectomies when they could have been treated with a nasal spray. So we're looking forward to an opportunity to work with public health to educate providers in our state about this disorder and uh, prevent a lot of unnecessary cost and, and suffering. Thank you, Mr. Cornett. Uh, the posture we're in is that uh, we were allowing time for Representative Byrd uh, on our discussion to offer an amendment. Are we ready with that? Yes, thank you. On page three after, at 86, there's a letter G to then do a new letter H. Just a second. Page three after G, so in other words, it would be kind of like line 92A? No, it would then be a new letter H. So it would be, an, a, sub, it would be a subsection there. On page three, there is a G, and now this would become an H. And it would read, the advisory board shall. After line 92, subsection H. Correct. The advisory board shall sunset after four years, comma, No, okay. After the director of the Department of Public Health has been appointed. So it talks about there's terms on here. Where's the attorney? We, we, we need a date. Representative Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I just want to make sure, Representative Jurgensen, I'm, I'm reading here uh, in this section that, that this board is required to report annually to the governor, to the General Assembly, um, and the division of the director of the Division of Public Health. Um, I have great sympathy in sitting behind Representative Byrd all these years, as I say. I'm, I always question things. I'm just wondering if... Yeah, perhaps in this case, and with this being such a critical issue and one that can save the state money and can help its citizens, since we are getting annual reports, that a future General Assembly, the one four years from now, can make that decision uh, of, of whether or not to, to continue with this, uh, with this board. That's the only reason I... Re Representative uh, Wilkinson, I, I appreciate that thought, and, and, and perhaps I was in Aaron calling on you. I'm going to let Representative Byrd finish hers. I'm sorry. And then let you make any adjustments that you feel are necessary. Representative Byrd. All right, so the effective date back on page 6, it would become effective July 1st, 2011. I'm sorry. All right. Well, we I'm, were on page getting, 3. That's right. All right, so we're going to put June 30th, 2015. Okay, let's start over. The advisory board shall sunset after four years.
and the director of the Republic, um, sorry, the Department of Public Health has been appointed because my understanding from this bill that that is going, that person, the director is going to be appointed by the governor. So the sunset date would be June 30th, 2015. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it's as clean as possible so members can understand before we get into the, the discussion on the merits of the particular amendment. Representative Byrd. July 1st. Representative Byrd. I'm listening. Yes, thank you. It, it, is your, it is your position, then, that your amendment should read, the advisory board shall sunset after four years, comma, and the director of public health has been appointed? That's correct. Is that it? Yes, but an and, end. And, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. We have a better idea. The advisory board shall sunset after four years on June 30th, 2015. After four years on June 30th, 30th 2015. 2015. Let me, I, I just want to read it since we don't have legal counsel here, we, 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 our note keeping's really got to be important. The advisory board, subsection H, after line 92, the advisory board shall sunset after four years on January 30th, 2015. June. I'm sorry, June 30th, 2015. That's correct. Just in the way that that's worded, and I'm trying to, does that mean it's four years after June 30th, 2015? Well, no, then on page six it tells you when it starts. Okay. We have an amendment that is being offered by Representative Byrd. Discussion on the amendment. Chairwoman Cooper. I think uh, if you're going to clarify it, I, I don't think you need to base it on when the director is appointed. Uh, that will either happen, and the bill goes into effect, I believe it's July 1st of this year. So I don't think there needs to be a mention of that to make it cleaner. Uh, of the appointment? Right, of the appointment. All right, it, Representative Maddox, I just look Tw now. Excuse, on, 23. Is it, is it on? I just look at it on, pay, on uh, page 4 on line 107, starting up at the top at 106, it says they shall be appointed and they shall serve a three-year term. If they serve a three-year term, Representative Byrd, uh, and we make it as four years, what's going to happen between that third year and the next year? Are we going to have new appointments or what's going to, did you see that? But my question is, if they appointed for three years, if he appoints another group, is he he can't say he's appointed for three years if it's going to sunset one year later. All right, then we'll do it 2014. <laughs> I've just caught that. I know. I saw that. <laughs> what do you think? Well, presumably they're going to redo that. Uh, all right. Any other discussion on the amendment? <laughs> Chairman Rogers. At the proper time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a substitute motion to uh, her amendment. Now is the proper time. I would uh, like to make a motion that we go back to the original language and remove the sunset. I don't. I don't think this disease will be have an opportunity to do. This committee, the advisory board, won't have the opportunity to do what they need to do in four years, and it's something that we're going to live with for a long time, so that's my motion. All right, we have a motion to go back to the original language as found in LC 371194S. Um, that is correct. Got a second on that motion? Got a second. Any discussion? Um, I ask the uh, representative, here again it says three-year term. Are we going to have any reappointments in the original? Are you, are you asking for a reappointment? Is it just going to? No, we're going to go back to the original what, what, version. We're, I'm amending her amendment, Dr. Maddox. No sunset. No sunset. Well, I, I realize that, but, I mean, it, it, it says they appointed for three years, and, but I don't see anything about them being reappointed in, in the original bill. I, I think it will continue on. I know Ms. Uh, Representative Burr is trying to 
right. sunset, but I think in this particular matter... It would be a reappointment then. Correct. Okay. Any other discussion on the Rogers Amendment? Hearing, hearing none, we got a first and a second on, to amend the Byrd Amendment, which would take it back to, by Representative Rogers, to take it back to the original language. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, like sign. Rogers Amendment carries. Now the the, po the posture is we now have the original bill back in place. We got a first and a second on that. All in favor of passing of the bill, the substitute. All, all in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign. Thank you, members of the committee. Representative Jurgerson. Thank you very much. Thank you to my able-bodied vice chair. Okay, let's call uh, House Bill 434, Representative Dempsey. Is she here? She just was here. Okay. We don't have 434? 434 is not in your... Does everybody have House Bill 434? been passed out? I'll just hand me one. Okay, 434. Okay. Okay. Everybody ready? Everybody has a copy of 434? Okay. We'll be working off LC 334084. Go ahead, Representative. Thank you, Chairman Cooper. Um, this bill comes to you today to maintain and clarify the licensed clinical social workers' authority to diagnose mental diseases and conditions in Georgia. Through conversations, uh, and yesterday even in the governor's office, we found out that in 1981, when the Practice Act was written first into legislation 30 years ago and then adopted in 1984, the original language was there. So we're looking really at two words. If you will look in Section 1, determinations changing to diagnosis, and in Section 2, it is determined to diagnose. Now, I know that bills with one word changes can look a little bit scary at the onset, but this is pretty simple. Right now, licensed clinical social workers in 40 other 41 other states, including all of those bordering Georgia, actually do this. We face a critical time and mental health service delivery here in our state as we begin to change that delivery process, particularly where I live right now. It is very heightened as the, um, uh, we look at closing a mental hospital possibly, but at least certainly changing that service. In the Practice Act, in 2005, the Department of Community Health made a determination and an interpretation, actually, to the Social Work Practice Act that no longer recognizes licensed clinical social workers. That's the only, only category that we're talking about. Uh, to give them the authority to diagnose Medicaid patients. For the past five years, that has been suspended. They have, during this time, though, practicing this with commercial, those who are insured by commercial and Medicare recipients. So it is just this one category. This comes to us with the support of the Behavioral Health, the Department of Behavioral Health, and uh, the Department of Community Health. They have looked at it, they believe in it, they support it. The psychologists right now are reimbursed at a higher rate. So there is possibly not only the fact that this will allow us better access to care, it also will allow for some cost-saving measures for those who are seeking that care through the social worker avenue. Um, I have uh, a couple of people here who I believe are ready to speak to the bill and and then if there are questions, certainly most willing to entertain those. Uh, See if we have any questions for you, oh, okay. First Representative mm -hmm. Dempsey. Any questions for mm -hmm. the representative? Okay. No questions for you. The person. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Representative Fullerton. Thank you, Chair, Madam Chairman. Um, did Where are the, the uh, Association of Social Workers on this? They have brought that to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And you said it was four years ago that DCH? It was five years ago, five years actually, DCH changed that the, the definition changed. And they have still continued to provide that service, that diagnosing for those who have commercial and Medicare, but not Medicaid patients. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. You have a couple people that come up and identify themselves and briefly, if they want to speak to the right. bill, very briefly. Right, and to, to address what oh. Representative Fullerton just asked, um, Jennifer Moore, the president of the National Association of Social Workers, Georgia Chapter, is here to speak to the bill. Okay. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your time this afternoon. I'm Jennifer Moore. I'm the president for the National Association of Social Work for the Georgia Chapter. I'm also here representing the School Social Workers as well as the Clinical Society of Social Work for Metro Atlanta and the Clinical Society of Social Work for Savannah. We are all in support of making this one word change. Even though it does not look substantial, it does uh, prov it will provide a greater access to care for clients, patients, um, specifically in rural areas of Georgia. And um, in light of the recent changes that we've gone through, um, to be able to provide this access to care for our clients will benefit everyone. Thank you. Are there questions? Next. Pardon? Are there any questions? No, it's fine. Next. Okay, you wait. Okay. You had a question? I'm sorry, Representative Reinders, you have a question? No, I do not. At appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion. Okay, it's the appropriate time. Thank you so much as co-sponsor of this particular outstanding piece of legislation. I see no Whoops, I think, wait a minute, I think we've Is that a conflict of interest? <laughs> that may have put the I, I, uh, on it. I, I, uh, I just like don't see. To reconsider. I don't, yeah, I don't see anything we can do but pass this marvelous piece of legislation. <laughs> Does anybody want to venture a second, or do I hear silence? No, you second it? <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Your daughter-in-law said you had. Does she ha does she does she have a lobbyist badge? And then she so. Uh, is there any serious discussion on this bill? All right. Hearing no further discussion, everyone in favor of House Bill 434 say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? No. The ayes have it. Thank you, Representative Dempsey. Don't go anywhere. I think you have another one. Okay, that's right. <coughs> okay, that'll be fine. Okay, I, right, but I think he needs to wait for another one too. You're gonna have to stay with us for a little while, Representative. Um, do we have a way of reaching you? Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, we have a bill that, it, pardon? Do you need something? Okay, uh, you all have a copy of House Bill 509. You check, this was not on our list for today. Um, as happens as we near the 30th day in the session, uh, sometimes we find that we have bills that we just have to have. Uh, they don't carry too much weight unless they happen to be from the governor's office. So with that, with the governor's floor leader, you have the mic. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the committee. This bill was just read for the first time. It is an administration bill, and uh, the purpose of it, despite being an 11-page bill, is very straightforward and simple. Uh, and it reflects what the governor has already recommended in the budget uh, and that the House Appropriations Committee uh, passed this morning. What we seek to do is... Uh, uh, abolish one board, the State Medical Education Board, whose primary purpose is to recruit uh, uh, doctors, primary care physicians to rural Georgia, merge that uh, with the Georgia Board for Physician Workforce. Uh, they already uh, have uh, uh, worked very closely together and share some of the same administrative personnel. Uh, the effect of this merger uh, would bring about, we think, great efficiency and some economy. Uh, the surviving board would be the Georgia Board for Physician Workforce, which is primarily a, a board whose purpose is to provide grants and loans to uh, ho hospitals and uh, teaching hospitals and other school and schools of medicine. The results of this is that uh, we would have one board eliminating one 15-member board, and once they are merged, uh, we would co-locate the surviving uh, board with the uh, 
uh, Georgia Composite Board, which is a licensing board, and the result would be about a $250,000 savings on an annual basis. We have to ask any questions. We'd ask for your uh, favorable okay. consideration. And to the committee, the posture that we're going to be in, since this hasn't been read the second time, um, tomorrow I wanted uh, the governor's floor leader to um, Representative Huckabee to present it to you so you would know what the board was about and let you ask questions. I will ask you to step out into the ante room tomorrow at some point after the bill is read for the second time and ask for a vote on the bill. But since we were meeting today and weren't going to have a formal meeting tomorrow, I wanted him. So questions for Representative Huckabee. Okay, Representative Reinders. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want members of the committee to know that the governor's budget goes through the um, uh, appropriation subcommittee of general government as does the secretary of state which handles the licensing board I, I, I chair that particular subcommittee and they've been very gracious in looking out to make sure that we have the most efficient government as possible and looking to see what kind of boards can we combine to to get the most efficiency possible and you also know i'm an advocate of rural georgia and this does nothing uh, that affects physician availability in rural Georgia, and That's I right. thank the governor's floor leader for bringing it to our attention. My pleasure, and thank we'll you. We'll continue to look at other boards throughout time, uh, both in the Secretary of State's office and the governor's office. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Representative Huckabee, we we'll see you tomorrow so, after thank it's you very read much. for the second time. Appreciate thank you. Okay. Where we stand? Uh, I guess. Representative Dempsey doesn't have it. Okay. We will go to House Bill 489. That's my bill. Okay. Representative Reinders, do I need to go to the well? Yes, I'd love to call on the lovely lady for, that represents Cobb County so ably, the chair of the finest committee in the House, Chairwoman Cooper, to present House Bill 489. Okay. Um, we're working on the substitute to House Bill 489, and that's LC 334168ERS. And I just want to make sure the trial lawyers and the attorneys are here from the Trial Lawyers Association. Good. They about drove me crazy because I thought they thought we were, we were going to do something to them. As you know, we are getting federal mandates on how we do things in the state, and one of them is uh, related to Medicare and looking for fraud in the Medicare system. Um, we have to put a program in place, and there across some of the states as they begin to look at when you do and uh, outsource these uh, contracts and you let people do it on a contingency basis, then you run into problems with those companies becoming overzealous. We certainly want them to do their job, but we do not want them uh, looking for haints in the Medicaid process and causing hospitals and providers undue stress when the system is already uh, pretty, uh, pretty hassle. Uh, it's a hassle. It's not a hassle-free system. So what this does is after July 1st, 2011, the department shall not enter into any contingency fee contract with a Medicaid, it's Medicaid recovery auditor contractor. It's very specific in the bill. It does not affect the lawyers. It doesn't affect all the con other contracts that are in place now. And I will be glad to answer any questions. And I will, uh, if the chairman will let me, let Ethan James from the hospital association who uh, knows more about this. Uh, this does have the department's approval. And Ethan? All right. Thank you so much, right. Madam Chair. First, uh, before we take his testimony, if you don't mind. Do we have any questions from members of the committee uh, to the chair in regards to the bill? Re Chairman Rogers. Uh, chair Lady Cooper, why are the trial lawyers so interested in this bill? Well, it was pretty open when the original bill was put in. It was, it was very open. It wasn't very specific. The substitute okay. is very specific. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman Apparently, Rogers. they did a lot of work on a contingency basis. I got you. Okay. So. Thank you, Chairman Rogers. Any other questions of the author from members of the committee? Uh, Representative Pack. Let's see if I can answer. Ma that. Madam Chairwoman, um, mm -hmm. a quick question. That, you know, on line 11, there's a term Medicaid recovery audit contractor, and it says as identified. 
And I'm assuming that, that that's specifically defined under that statute. I didn't get a chance to read the federal statute, but it that is. Medicaid recovery audit contractor is defined? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Pack. Any other questions for representative of the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other, anyone else wish to speak on the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, I think uh, Chair Chairman Cooper did a fine job presenting this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. I did want to point out that this is not necessarily a fraud-based uh, audit contract. It's really just to identify underpayments as well as, or overpayments as well as underpayments to providers. There are other. That, that didn't find so. It's uh, e easy to uh, confuse the two issues, but this is to identify the underpayments and overpayments to providers. Um, right. Please identify other, yourself and who you're with I'm again. Sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm Ethan James with the Georgia Hospital Association. Any questions for Mr. James? Representative Harden. The, uh, to make a motion. <coughs> Any other questions for Mr. James? Representative Harden, you're recognized at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to propose do pass for. House Bill 489, LC 3341680ERS. As a substitute, we've got a motion and we have a second. Okay. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of this fine presentation and fine legislation signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Like sign. Aye. The substitute for House Bill 49 passes. Uh, Representative Reinders, uh, sometimes we talk so much about looking for hates and problems that we forget that people can make mistakes and uh, that the government can make mistakes too for the overpayments and underpayments uh, to providers in, ho in the hospitals and also I stand corrected. Thank you very much. I won't make that mistake again uh, if it makes it to the well. Um, are you ready, Representative Dempsey? Okay. Uh, this would be uh, House Bill 479. Thank you. You ready? Thank you, Chairman Cooper. Um, this comes to you today um, to close a loophole, an existing law that creates a potential for abuse for home care providers in Georgia. Federal IRS regulations require independent contractors to be non-supervised workers, but state licensing requirements governing these agencies require them to supervise care. So by definition, care workers cannot be independent contractors. Just an example of that, agencies tell workers where to go, what time to arrive, the uniform to wear, issues like that that absolutely um, show that they are supervised. Uh, it will reconcile the discrepancy between the state regulations which require supervised care by a licensed private duty provider and federal regulations which require an independent contractor to be unsupervised by definition. Uh, at the end of the legislative day today, uh, there were some changes that were brought forward by DCH, and since Betsy's not here, I know this may be a little bit challenging, but let's see if we can work through it and make make it work here, if that's okay. And you pass out copies of those? We do not have it. It has just been negotiated out in the hallway, actually. Uh, could I see it? Um, Stand down for just a minute and let me look at that.
suspend with that. It just, it's too complicated without us being sent. It's not that major of a change, but to look at it that way on the fly without every member being able to see it is not really a good idea. Um, if uh, we'll look at its importance and uh, probably bring it to you tomorrow when you pull you out. Uh, sounds like we may need to go to the speaker's conference room instead of just out in the ante room uh, to look at this bill. Thank you, Representative Dempsey. If you'll just get that drawn up so we can uh, have it where all the members can see it. I just don't want to do that on the fly. Okay, Representative, we're getting you out of something really bad. Pardon? Ways and means. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Rogers, did you? I'll wave. I had a question for her. Oh, do okay. you want Betsy? I mean, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, Didn't pick it up in time. I apologize. Okay, and that's the other one? Or is this one? Okay, fine. Okay, uh, Representative Stevens. Let's see, which one are we doing? Where's the Where's Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> okay, we're going to do uh, House Bill 479 first. Uh, yes, Wait a minute, 457. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's LC number 334171S. Uh, whenever we voted out the other day these um, automatic dispensing machines remote from a remote locations, we inadvertently brought in the hospital pharmacies and their Pixis machines. What we've done is we just went in and stripped out all the language and just put the uh, the remote dispensing machines under the purview of the um, pharmacy board and allowed them to um, draw up rules and regs. That's all that it does. That way as technology moves along, it moves along with it. Questions for the representative? Okay. I don't see any questions. Uh, Representative Wilkins, you. Chair, I move to pass the committee substitute House Bill 457 LC 33 Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, seeing no discussion, everyone in favor of the passage to the substitute? Mm -hmm. uh, the substitute to House Bill 457 say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? No. The ayes have it. Okay, uh, you have just been handed a substitute to House Bill 307. And since we've just gotten this, I've seen and know about it. I think I want you to walk the committee through it, please. Oh, boy. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. The, um, this substitute that you're looking at, the LC 334162S, um, uh, essentially adds the definition of a burn trauma center. Um, some of you might remember in Port Wentworth a couple of years ago, we had a um, massive explosion, uh, killed a whole lot of people um, down at the sugar refinery in my area. And um, we, with our level one trauma center, we uh, had to send the majority of these patients up to Augusta, to the burn center. Um, all that this bill does essentially and recognizes the, um, um, and it doesn't change at all uh, any of the existing trauma centers. Now, what it does is it adds a burn center to the level of a trauma center, is essentially all that it does. But if the, um, and this is the first moment I've had a chance to look at the bill also, the but I, as okay. we scan through it. Okay. Um, Representative Stevens, um, how many burn centers do we have in the state of Georgia? Two. Two. Um, so. Grady and, um, and MCG are the two burn centers. Uh, so when a patient is burned, the decision is uh, where to take them. Exactly. And then the closest one in the time thing. So if they're closer to uh, Augusta, they go there. If right. they're closer to Atlanta, they, they come to the Atlanta Burn Center. Okay. Right, uh, Representative Reiners. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I apologize. I'm, I may just be behind the times. What is the Augusta Burn Center? Pardon? I'm trying to, I can't remember the name. Yes. Representative Sims, of course, from Augusta. Right, did you, Representative Joseph Sims, Steel let me turn Burn on your Center. mic so you can answer the question. Joseph Steele Burn Center. With yeah. that, okay. 
uh, allow me if you would, Madam sure. Chair, to continue. Would that not be a trauma burn center? If we pass this bill, it would be a, a it would be eligible uh, as a trauma center, uh, not a level one, two, three, or four, but just as a burn. The Augusta center. center would be right. So there would be three. I just thought a minute ago when you said yeah. it. Was, I'm sorry, M MCG is going to be one trauma center. The burn center would just be designated as a trauma center. This would, I think what Mr. Robertson Ryan is saying, this would be the second one. I'm sorry, I'm, you're right. Thank you. And, and if I may, in the future, just help me wrap my mind around this, what would stop a Valdosta or a TIF Regional or a Rome from saying, I want to be a burn center? That is a valid, a valid point. And if there is a need in Valdosta, and there should be, quite honestly, uh, because we only have two in the entire state uh, that the burn center uh, and I've just been pointed that they've got to have uh, in the community health center as a burn center must have at least 300 patients annually so if they're large enough to do that yeah but currently all of them would have zero wouldn't they currently to fit under this bill they, they would have to admit at least 300 patients annually to qualify as a burn center if this bill passes yeah okay uh, representative Watson Thank you very much. Maybe I can clarify this a little bit. Uh, I think the, the still burn center in, in Augusta is, is not affiliated with MCG, um, but is a burn center. And then the, then the one here in Grady is a burn center. But the, and, and Valdosta or, or other places could do it, but you need significant volume to you know, reach quality standards. Uh, and, that, and that's the main issue there. And, and, I, and if I may, I, I agree with you, but I'm just wondering the way it's written, where it says you must see at least 300. Is that 300? Burn three hundred patients per year. Oh, that three hundred burn patients. Burn patients. Burn patients. And if you're currently seeing zero, you, I, I, oh, how do you get Because you're sending. Oh, I them, see. So how, I, do, how do you ever achieve? How do you ever achieve the three hundred? Uh, well, you, actually, that, that's a very good question. You would never qualify as a burn center until you reach three hundred patients annually. That's so right. You, and so you would you wouldn't be designated yet. So you would you would. You would march up, and you would try to qualify for that. Uh, so you would have to reach the standards on that, the way I would understand it. Right. Let, let me, if I can continue. What makes the 300 the magical number as opposed to 200? Is there a cost justification? Like you said, and, and you're exactly right, you have to do enough volume in order to justify the cost, or in fact we end up raising the cost. Okay. Well, how do we get the number 300? I don't know where the 300 came from, but they're generally quality-driven uh, issues with that. Sort of like doing, uh, you know, bypasses. You, you need to do a certain number to reach the quality standards. Representative Jurgensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. What What is the um, ultimate goal of a facility reaching this designation? What does that allow them to do once they see 300 patients and they have this designation? Clearly, if they are, they would be part of the formula once the, um, the formula is driven for the trauma centers just to be part of that total formula. As a trauma, if you're designated as a trauma center, once that pie is divvied up uh, and you're a burn center and you meet all the qualifications, then you're part of that pie, as you should be. What, what is your um, expectation of the number of places that would potentially reasonably qualify for this designation around the state? These two, the two that we have. I don't see, quite honestly, with our population and the way that we are, I don't see us. Uh, and with the um, transport, helicopter transport we've got, we can do what we need to do under the current two drop, um, burn centers in the state. Okay, thank you. We're having a meltdown on the lights are flashing everywhere and we think it was people helping people. Are we missing anybody that wants to? Okay. Representative, uh, let me see if I can, and Jurgensen. We have a burn center, we have one burn, burn center now at Grady and that's a trauma center. We have another burn center and it has not been des designated as a trauma center yet. Correct. I think to Representative Reiner's, burns are so traumatic and they take such specialized nursing care, uh, equipment, facilities, 
intensive physician care that for most hospitals and somebody from the hospital association, correct me if they're wrong, they don't want them. Uh, they're very, very expensive and long-term hospitalizations and they would rather take them to a center where that is what they sort of specialize in doing. So the possibility, and of course our population is supposed to, after a couple of years to explode, we're supposed to be about the sixth fastest growing state in the nation and I guess in the future we could need one in some other area but uh, I think most of the time uh, most hospitals just want to, if they get a patient that's burned, if they can't take them directly, they stabilize them and move them as quickly as they possibly can. And if I may add one thing, Madam Chairman, the key on a trauma center is readiness. That's what you're paying for is readiness. And and with the burn centers that we've got, especially the one that was in Augusta where I've got some personal knowledge of and I brought a gentleman on the, on the floor of the house, had that readiness not been there, we would have been in serious trouble. So all that I'm, that I'm asking for for this designation is that these burn centers be also included with the trauma definition so that they're ready whenever we have a problem. How many patients were burned in that explosion? How many died? Um, I, I can't remember the whole the total number, but the people who are now back to work that were seriously burned uh, is about 50, uh, okay. and we lost um, a lot of good friends. Friends, Ma so. Madam Chair, uh -huh. my only concern I support 100% the intent of the bill. My only concern, and I, and I hope the committee hears this, is I, I want to make sure as a committee we're not sending the wrong message of a standard so high as you're right, as this growing population, that if another hospital down the road, I, I'm, I'm just asking about the 300. I don't want the standard so high that what happens is 10 years from now we only have two when maybe we need three. I, I'm, I'm just questioning the wisdom of the 300. I'm not questioning the wisdom of whether we need it. I just, that's, that's where I'm at on this. We, we don't need to have the Department of Community Health tell someone down the road, you don't qualify. That's my point. And if I can just respond, it, I, and I appreciate that, but if, if a um, facility is willing to invest in a trauma burn center uh, and, and is also willing uh, to, to wait until they can hit that number with that investment, that's a, that's a pretty good indication that they see the long-term need. It's a good question. Uh, Representative Watson. Just at the appropriate time, we could make a motion. Um, and to um, just for a moment, I, Representative Reiners, I think the criteria comes from the American Burn Association. Okay. Okay. Um, and of course, at any time, should South Georgia grow to the point and put in, and for some reason begin to have a, a large number of burn patients, then I'm sure that even in your dotage you could, as a legislator, could come and offer an amendment to the bill. I, I appreciate And hopefully that. I could still remember enough stuff that I could help you get it passed. I, I appreciate the fact that you're now telling me there's a standard which this number set by, which was my only point. Thank okay. you, Madam Chair. So, and I was just trying to, to razz you a little I bit. I understand. But it would be, it'd look real good in Lee County. <laughs> So I think that hospitals in Lee County might want to go after some other kind of health care that's a little more um, traumatic and uh, not quite as expensive. Okay. Oh, Representative Rogers. All I, all I was going to say, I know the Augusta Hospital is probably the largest burn center in the country, if I remember right. Isn't that correct? That is Chairman? true. Okay. I think that's the standard uh, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Watton, Watson, you were once again recognized. I'd like to make a motion that we pass this. Okay, we have a motion. Woo, okay, great. A motion and, uh, and lots of seconds. Anyone, any further discussion? We got five who's... You know, oh, Representative Rogers. Okay, this thing is crazy today. Okay, uh, seeing no one else that has any questions. Uh, everyone in favor of the passage of the substitute to House Bill 307 say aye. aye. Anyone opposed no? 
and the eyes have it. Thank, Thank you Madam very Chair, much. Committee. Thanks to the committee. We'll see you tomorrow for a brief, brief meeting when I let you know.